Well, hello everybody and welcome to this week's Coffee Break for Cover Crops webinar. Today's speaker is Jeff Sanders who works for the Northwest Crops and Soils Program with the University of Vermont Extension. Um, today he'll be talking about options for interceding cover crops. Um, before I turn the mic over to Jeff, I just wanted to mention our sponsors for today who include the Northeast Extension Risk Management Education Center, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, and Northeast SARE. Jeff will be giving his presentation for the next 20 or so minutes and then we'll take your questions. Um, and I'm just going to turn it right on over to Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Deb. Uh, I'm Jeff Sanders. I work with Heather Darby and the team up here in St. Albans. Uh, do a lot of work uh, with cover cropping and in particular with uh, trying to get cover crops out onto farms on a uh, farm-wide scale, so we've done a lot of work with a lot of different methods, and um, I appreciate the invitation to uh, talk about this this morning uh, with the folks on, on the webinar. Um, we're going to run through uh, several, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about intercede and then run through a bunch of different methods, and uh, the, semin the webinars have covered a bunch of this, uh, but why, why is interseeding important? Because the growing season is short and we're trying to establish the cover crop into the already growing uh, crop, cash crop, and there's some challenges with that which uh, the previous speakers in the previous weeks have, have addressed. Um, and again, uh, the short growing season, getting covers established in a timely manner, uh, especially slow to establish cover crop species. Uh, and there's some challenges with that we'll talk about. And also cover cropping is a way to maybe get multiple things done at the same time on your on your field. Like say you're sowing covers with a spreader while side dressing or even with a the internet inner seeding technologies inner seeder, you can add fertilizer or herbicide to that unit and, and do multiple uh, cropping um, cropping practices in, in one pass. Also, uh, post-harvest, uh, some folks use uh, harrows or, or tillage tool to lightly work in cover crops, but you can also work in manure at the same time. So you can get two birds with one stone. And also the, uh, the opportunity to cover crop with no-till and the importance that, that cover cropping, having properly established cover crops, uh, the benefits that that provides to your no-till crop rotations is, is huge. Uh, they complement each other very, very well. So those are some of the reasons why we would uh, intercede. So I have I've put together this busy chart that we're going to run through quickly, but the different methods of interceding uh, from frost seeding all the way down to broadcasting post-harvest. And we're just going to quickly run through this. There's a lot here uh, as we work through it. But the earliest, the earliest method of interseeding really is frost seeding in the spring. Um, you're, interseeding, you're interseeding a crop into a crop. Uh, and, and typically, we would use a hard seed like a clover that can, that can tolerate the, the weather at that time of year. Uh, and I also have a list of the, like a, a pro and a con, like the major one for each practice. And you know, frost seeding is very simple; it's inexpensive. The con for that is that you get highly variable results. Um, Thirty percent is typically what you may see for growth. So it's a practice that you would want to do every year to improve pastures and meadowland. Uh, especially if they're deficient in legumes. So there's different methods. We have the old tried and true hand method, and we also have uh, a unit mounted on the back of an ATV. Um, the university has purchased a few of these this season and did a bunch. They're two to four hundred dollars a piece. Um, works pretty well. The second the method is just broadcasting. Uh, at top dress time. So uh, you would go out with your urea or your fertilizer and you add the seed to that. Uh, we need to be uh, aware of the shade tolerant 
seed varieties because uh, that's going to sit there a long time. Um, a pro to broadcasting is that's very convenient. Uh, the two birds with one stone thing, and uh, a con is that we typically, depending on what species of cover crop you're using, you would see you could see banding in the field, so you wouldn't get uniform coverage. And also a, a concern that we've seen is uh, soil to seed seed to soil contact is is uh, somewhat variable depending on the weather after you apply the seed. We really need rain to to ensure that contact. If we don't get it, we don't get good germination. But equipment can be anything from a three-point hitch spreader on the back of, a, of an old tractor, works fine, uh, to uh, this unit here, which, which a local vendor purchased this season, uh, top end. I think this unit here will throw the seed, uh, the one on the left will throw the seed 30 feet, and the one on the right, this thing here may throw fertilizer as far as you know 80 feet to each side of, of the unit. So there's lots of different ways to, to broadcast the seed. Um, another method that folks are starting to use is cult at cultivation. So it would be the same as uh, you spread your top dress, you spread your fertilizer on your cornfields and then you would go out and incorporate that fertilizer with a, with a cultivator and at the same time, put put some uh, put some cover crop down, and uh, we would again at this time of year use small seed because you can only carry so much on the cultivator. And if you're putting down winter rye or a large seed, you'd have to fill up quite a bit more often. So a small seed uh, seeded cover crop would work better there. Um, a pro would be that you're incorporating the seed and the fertilizer at the same time and the con it could be uh, if you have herbicides down in the soil you're actually going to bring that seed uh, closer to that herbicide that's that's worked into the soil which could be a problem as well as uh, the seed would be placed at in in uh, at a inconsistent depth so it's not really uniform, so that could cause some issues, something to be aware of. And there's different units for this. It's just a six-row cultivator with a herd spreader on it, or uh, this unit here is a, a rotary hoe unit, which would obviously scratch the ground quite a bit more. Um, it looks like, I haven't seen this unit, but it looks like it's in a cord field. I'm not sure exactly how that would work with the cornrows. Uh, but anyways, people are doing these types of things, trying, trying to incorporate seed into the ground. Uh, a, a unit, the next method would be a drill interseeder, which we're quite excited about. Uh, UVM has, a, has acquired one of those through a national CIG grant, and, and we have plans to use it quite widely uh, this spring on a bunch of different farms. And typically, uh, the folks uh, in Quebec and Ontario are seeding uh, small seeded shade tolerant crops at V4 to V8, which is actually pre pre side dress. Uh, the corn is not very tall at that point, and uh, so it's early. And like in the next five weeks, we would start. Um, the a pro for this, and the and the key is uh, again we're getting seed to soil contact. We're actually drilling that seed into the field, and uh, a con uh, we have not used it widely, but a con would be there's a potential for corn damage where you turn on the end rows, depending on how the piece is planted. When when we turn, uh, we're going to have to run over some corn unless it's planted straight through to the end. Where you could pull out into the into the buffer or something. So we're gonna have to monitor and see how that goes. Our hope is that at V4, um, the corn would recover quite well because it, it isn't that tall. So we're gonna see how that goes. But here's here's a picture. Everyone's probably seen these. Uh, it's just like a it's a modified drill. Uh, it's, so it's a, like a high rise drill. You can see that. The distance between the the drilling unit, the the part of the drill that contacts the ground and and puts the seed down to the seed box is about three feet. So it's going to allow for the for the plant to clear 
and not get beat up as as we go down through the field. And it's just it's a very typical drill with uh, there's a just a coulter in the front, a V opener, and then a packing wheel. Very simple. Uh, it's just this modified frame that that makes it the innovation that it is. Um, so so that's that's the interseeder. Uh, the next piece of equipment method is using a high high clearance equipment and there's a few of these around UVM uh, acquired one of these through the same CIG grant we ran it quite extensively last year on maybe 15 to 1700 acres um, and that can be done anywhere from V4 to to harvest really uh, unless the corn is 12 to 14 foot tall with that Hagee unit you can drive over it it doesn't damage the corn at all. Um, you can't really even see where you went in the field. Uh, it is cost effective uh, because you can cover quite a few acres at a fairly low price. Um, again, we're broadcasting the seed. Uh, so there's risk involved with just broadcasting seed. You're really, it's weather dependent on, on to how well that'll catch. And uh, another issue that we found last year was the shade tolerance of the seedling, uh, the winter rye really didn't tolerate this, the shading that the these guys, these farmers up here, uh, corn silage systems are really pushing uh, yields and so they're planting quite densely and some of them are using 20 inch rows, 22 inch rows and so there's a lot of shade, not a lot of sunlight getting down to the ground and that's definitely a factor uh, with this method, any method that just throws seed on the ground. So um, here's some photos of that inner seeder. It's just a bunch of drop tubes with an air seeder uh, and you just go up and down the rows. This is the delivery, it, so it hits the splash pan and the seed just kind of spreads, you know, like 30 inches wide out of each one of these. Um, and and the lower photo here just shows the clearance. You can walk under that very easily. Um, six two, six three. I don't have to bend bend down at all. Um, so it does a nice it does a nice job uh, of of getting through the field without damage to the to the cash crop, which is important. Uh, there's another picture of it in action, and you can see uh, that the corn's quite tall there. I would say the corn is nine to ten feet tall. And and it, it just goes down through it. You have to pick your spot and and stay on your rows so you, that you aren't knocking all the corn all over. But it it works for that. Um, another method which UVM uh, has been quite involved with over the over the past several years has been the aerial application of seed. And and that would be something that would be done probably a little bit later. Uh, then, then at top dress, like at tassel, uh, between tassel and harvest, and uh, I have the seed seed mix down as being winter cereals. Just mostly, like uh, Kirsten said last week, it has to do with ballistics and trying to get seed to travel through the air while you're driving or flying at 30 miles an hour. Uh, it needs to be quite heavy to get it to to get it to spread properly. Um, the, a, a huge pro of using using aerial seed is that there's absolutely no field disturbance. Uh, the field is, you know, if it's wet or whatever, hilly, doesn't matter. Uh, the helicopter doesn't care. Uh, the downside to to an aerial application um, again would be soil to seed contact costs may be a little bit prohibitive in some cases, and it's also weather dependent. Uh, wind wind over eight miles an hour uh, kind of compromises the the flight of the seed and actually the flight of the helicopter as well. So there's some issues there. Um, here's a couple of the helicopters that we've worked with and I just want to point out that there's different delivery systems even on helicopters. This is a Bell helicopter and, and it, it has these, uh, it was an air seeder essentially a big blower blowing the seed out of these pipes. That's how that's how that, that worked. And it had deflectors in the middle to kind of cover under 
the helicopter. And so that's one method. And then <clears throat> this is a R44 uh, Raven. Is a Robinson, I believe. Um, this has a spinner, so that it has a hopper in the back that is filled with seed, and then it slings the seed on. This spins at probably 3,000 RPM, and it, it really wings the seed. Uh, if he turns it on while you're standing by the helicopter, it'll it'll leave marks on your on your legs if you're wearing shorts for sure. So it, it slings it out. There's also, I believe, this year in the area there may be a, a long line. They call it a long line system available, which would uh, which has a separate union uh, unit under the helicopter, which would act, I think, like a uh, an air blow an air seeder, but it doesn't attach to the helicopter; it just has a cable. And I, I don't have a picture of that today, but so there's different options with aerial seeding as well. Um, so those would be all the methods that we would use during the crop season and and that's really what is available but I want to talk a little bit about post harvest um, for folks that grow shorter day corn and can get their corn off you know we have we have some other methods available to uh, ensure good cover crop and one of them is a is just a normal grain drill um, at this time of year we're fairly limited. We're, now we're talking mid-September uh, to early October, and we're limited to our winter cereals in this area, uh, triticale, winter rye, uh, oats, things, varieties like that. And the pro of a grain drill is that you get soil to seed contact uh, and uniformity. It really, it really works quite well. Uh, for getting good stands. The the issue with drilling seed is that it's very slow uh, relative to other methods. Um, so that's a consideration if you have a lot to do. Uh, here's a couple of grain drills. Here's a sunflower drill and it's just a big seed box and tubes coming down and then and then units. Here's a John Deere drill. Um, so you just it's, the seed just comes out these shoots and it is incorporated and packed into the ground. Uh, and it works. It works very well, and and a lot of folks use them. Uh, UVM's got a couple of them, and and they get used a lot, uh, spring and fall. Um, so the next method is an air seeder on a on a tillage tool or any other any tool really. But I'm, I'm thinking particular of tillage, vertical tillage, maybe or a set of harrows. Um, it'd be post harvest again. We're limited to winter cereal, which is an issue because you, it requires a much higher seeding rate than, say, an annual ryegrass, maybe 18 to 20 pounds to the acre, where a winter cereal would be 75 to 100 pounds to the acre. So the amount of volume of product you have to work with is much higher. Um, a pro is that it's uh, seed to soil contact very good, incorporates the seed, it's fast. Uh, if you have a 20 or 30 foot tool, you can cover a lot of ground in a day. Um, a con is uh, the seed quality is very important. The not the quality of the particular seed and germination rate, but it has to be clean seed or it'll plug it'll plug the uh, air seeder. So bin run seed that hasn't been cleaned does not work well in an air seeder and. Um, the depth can be inconsistent, and it can, it can be a little more expensive than using a drill. And here's a picture of a unit. You can see the big, the big cedar up up here. This is and on this is on a Salford vertical tillage tool. Um, so it just runs hoses out, and they, it dumps its seed right in front of. You see these big springs, but under there, there's coulters down here. So it just works that seed into the ground, and and. Uh, you can cover a lot of ground in a day. It, it works. It works fine. Um, and the last, the last, the last ditch method of of cover interseeding cover cropping post harvest is broadcast. Um, again, winter cereals. Uh, it's easy. You just hook on to the spreader and go. Uh, the issue is seed to soil contact, and it'll be highly could be highly variable. And there's my picture of what we would use to 
broadcast seed on in the fall um, after harvest, I, I don't recommend it. We we run into there's a better methods. If you want to get if you want to get uh, seed established late that late in the season, um, incorporating the seed works so much better because you shorten that time to germination. It versus if you just lay the seed on top. So in summary, uh, there's a, a variety of methods that are available regionally. So we think about hitting windows, windows of opportunity through the whole season. And and now with with the equipment that's here and the equipment that's coming, we can do that. So um, I encourage people to consider that the cover cropping. Um, it does require proper plans and contingency plans because if you miss windows, uh, we were talking early earlier before the before the webinar about interseeding, and if it's all wet in June and we have to go to the high boy, we're going to have to purchase more seed because the seeding rates are different. So you have to be flexible in how you implement your cover cropping plan, and 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 it's important to have that flexibility. Um, you need to know why you're doing it and you, to overcome the challenges that are associated with it because uh, if you're in it for any other reason than, than to be successful and to improve your soil health and, and it, for the right reasons, then it, it can be frustrating. Um, so really important things to keep in mind which have all been brought up through, these webinar, through this webinar series is herbicide plan, uh, corn planting rates because of the shading and also uh, one thing we're also seeing is that the plant architecture makes a difference. Uh, we found last year that vertical leaf corn hybrids uh, work better for getting cover crops established because they allow more light to reach the soil and, and the university is going to be doing some more work on that this year. Um, and I mean in summary, the soil to seed contact in general reduces risk of failure in most cases. So that's that would be the the take home is if you can get soil to sea contact through whatever method you're using, um, that would be the way the way to do it. So uh, that's that's pretty much what I have. Uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take those now. Deb. Great, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, before we turn it over to questions, we're just going to um, administer a little quick poll. Some of you who have, have participated in these before will be familiar with this. So what we're going to do is just click on one of the responses to this question, did you learn anything new today? And if you just click on one of those responses, that will be great. Thanks. All right. Just have one more question. Okay. Here comes question number two. As a result of what you learned, will you make a change on your farm or how you advise farmers? So if you could just click on one of those responses, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. All righty. Great. So now we're going to uh, move on right on over to our Q&A. And as a reminder, to pose a question for Jeff, what you're, you'll do is just type your question into the question box and press enter. I'll be reading those out loud to Jeff. Um, if you happen to be on a mobile device today, you'll just look for the question mark. Um, click on that to open up the question box. And Jeff, we already have some questions in the queue here, so I'm just going to launch right in, okay? Sure. <clears throat> so the first question is, can you talk about the difference um, between uh, solid round disks versus fluted disks on seed drills in clay soils? Um. I I think that fluted discs tend to open the ground the slot in the ground wider that's why they're fluted and the solid disc would just slice the soil um, on grain drills typically UVM's drills we run solid disc because the the narrower the slot you open the easier it is to close and and the same, it's, I had to switch over, as soon as you mentioned disc and fluted, I go to corn planting, so I had to convert back over to grain drills. <laughs> but um, 
I think that I think that uh, the solid discs work fine, and because we're really looking to do as a minimal amount of soil disturbance, we just want to get the seed in the soil and then covered. So I, I don't think the fluted discs are necessarily an advantage in clay soil in particular because clay soils are harder to close than than loamier soils. So thank you. Okay, um, Jeff, so you mentioned um, some of UVM's equipment. Is there a process um, for farmers to be able to access that equipment? Yes. Uh, Contact, you can contact uh, the university or you can contact the Northwest Crops and Soil Team uh, or you can email me directly. Uh, I think we can provide that email or Deb can, yep. should I just give it? It's, yeah, it's just I Jeffrey, yeah. Jeffrey Doss Sanders at uvm.edu and we would work with you to help you access it if it's feasible to do. Uh, we, we really want the equipment to be used, so uh, let us know. There's probably some location parameters, etc. There is. I mean, it's got to be feasible. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. got to be feasible to do. But we are, we do work hard to accommodate people. Mm -hmm. uh, it just has has to be able to be done. So. In and um, are there any other options that you might suggest for getting access to equipment before they actually purchase it? Um. The, the best way is is to try it on your farm. I mean, work, working with the university, uh, we have access to most of this equipment, and and we would love to do a demo on your farm. If or if you can't, if we can't say you're in the southern part of the state or out of state, we could help work with you to bring you to a farm that has it done in the state near to where the equipment's being operated for you to see. And if, if we have a conversation about soil types and stuff, we can probably match you up with something close to your home, so it may be more relative to you. Uh, but but we'll do what we can. We're here to educate and outreach, and, and I think that these things are important. Mm -hmm. So we're we're very accommodating. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, and probably now's a good time to mention that we do have field days, on-farm field days throughout the season, yeah. as well as an annual no-till cover crop conference where. You know, folks um, can't go out and see that. Sometimes we'll have farmer panels who can um, kind of describe what it's what it's like to have some of use some of this equipment. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay. So, any suggestions on best winter cereals and legumes to add for fall seedings using broadcasting? But, yeah. Uh, by far, for depends on what you want. But if you want good fall cover. I would recommend oats. Uh, they are going to winter kill, but they grow fat. They seem to grow faster, in my experience, than winter rye coming out of the ground in a, in a broadcast. Um, and red clover, white clover. Uh, I think in a fall broadcast, it's a little bit too late um, to get the clovers to establish. I think the NRCS cutoff for that is September 1st, so. You have to be aware of that. Um, really, legumes and such is an earlier earlier in the season application. Uh, winter rye works good in the fall. It, it'll catch uh, pretty much anywhere. Uh, it seems to be a little slower growing in the fall when you broadcast it, uh, but you'll get terrific spring growth uh, with that with that product. So, um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, I think that's it for questions, unless anyone has one less, one last question for Jeff. We have about a minute left. If not, just give. Well, I can I can also comment further on that. A lot of guys are doing triticale as well for winter cereal. Um, it's a little more expensive though, so it depends on what you want to use the covers for. Uh, as to your tolerance for price and, and application method. So you got to have goals to make, make this work. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Hey, Jeff, um, what kinds of plants are compatible with oats and pea that will come up after 
um, the oat and pea is, is over, or I'm assuming has is, is been killed. So, so I'm guessing in the fall you planted oats and peas and they died off, and you want to know what will come up in the spring? I'm not sure if I understand the question, but uh, if you mix oats and winter rye, uh, we did some of that last year, and the oats will die off, and the and the winter rye will come up in the spring, but it'll be a little bit less thick and a little easier to deal with if you're using tillage equipment than if you went with a full rate of winter rye. And I'm I'm pretty sure the peas are all going to be dead, and I, I, depending on when you seeded them, uh, I don't I'm not sure how much of cover you'll have left there in the spring. I think it shrivels up pretty small so um, I don't know if that answers your question or not okay well thank you Jeff um, we are out of time um, I just wanted to let folks know that we have one more um, webinar in our series um, that will be next Wednesday the 25th of May where uh, Sandra Permard from NRCS will be talking about NRCS programs for cover cropping so stay tuned for that one um, Jeff thank you so much for um, for giving this great talk today and thank you all for coming have a great day. thank you mm -hmm. enjoy your day bye-bye Bye.